Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm your host, Lindsay Smith, and welcome to The Agronomists. We've got a great show lined up for you tonight. Uh, one of my favorite topics, of course, insects. Um, and I've got two fabulous guests. But of course, before we get rolling on that, just a quick reminder to everybody, um, our guests here for sure, hi, Kara, um, are here to answer your questions. So if you've got a certain insect pest uh, problem or something you really want to know about, we're going to talk some forecasts, all those sorts of good things. Be sure to uh, pop on over to the comments there, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Um, we'll get to as many as we can. So thanks so much for that. And of course, don't forget that uh, participating tonight uh, in the agronomist means you are eligible for CEU credits if you're into that sort of thing. So head on over tomorrow morning uh, at realagriculture.com slash agronomists and sign up for your credits. Um, as I said, um, it is insect night. And Jason says he doesn't like insects. Oh, we're going to, you are going to like them by the end of tonight. All right. So joining me, uh, we've got our Omafra entomologist, Tracy Bowdy and Government of uh, Saskatchewan, Ministry of Agriculture, Dr. James Tanzi. Welcome here, the two of you. How are you? Great, well, thanks. <laughs> Good, okay, so James, I'm gonna start with you because I was, I figured being here at the tail end of March, we should, we should discuss, you know, in like a lion, out like a lamb, how's that going for Saskatchewan tonight? Uh, swimmingly, <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're currently, currently in the midst of a, of a pretty serious blizzard uh, after okay. some uh, some fairly warm, dry conditions. So, right. So the moisture, though, needed, right? A moisture, yeah, moisture is needed, certainly. Yeah, but I'm okay. pretty happy to see the moisture. Okay, but, but maybe not the blizzard part. Um, Tracy, of course, you're you're in uh, southwestern Ontario. We're not we're doing not too bad, right? Oh, it's going to be 17 tomorrow. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay, it's I, I need to move because it's not going to be that west of Ottawa, <laughs> just so you know. Okay, but um, I don't know it's always it's always fun. And we are, of course, heading into April by the end of this week, which is pretty exciting. Feels like um, as much as this past year has been really challenging and really long in a lot of ways, here we are gearing up for the planting and seeding season. So, of course, we yes, we have to talk about, you know, getting that seed bed ready and weed control, but insects and especially, especially early season, really, really key. So um, Tracy, I'll maybe start with you before we head into any of our clips. Um, is there a particular pest you're really keeping your eye on for this growing season in Ontario? Yes. I, well, a few actually, and I think they're all um, pesticide related or transgenic related. So any resistant issues, we're starting to see enough uh, rootworm as well, just monitoring for what's going on with western bean cutworm and spider mites. All of those are going to be something we need to keep an eye on and report if any ineffective applications happen or just signs that something's not right, not the, the things aren't being effective uh, at controlling them. So, but it, in this year like we're having where it's starting, it started off pretty early and warm, uh, we may even see pests like black cutworm come in early um, or any of the um, early season below ground pests coming up and feeding um, for looking for anything that's in the ground or on the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, so absolutely. We are, Ontario at least is in a in quite a different boat than much of the prairies. Uh, big parts of the prairies of course are very dry, but they too have had not just a, a dry winter, but a mild winter. So. I mean, blizzards notwithstanding, James, but um, it's it has been, of course, you know, there's been talk and there's certainly been uh, people rolling in Alberta already. So, James, what's on your radar for 2021? What are you looking at? There, there are a few things. And, and, and I guess maybe what I'll do is uh, is uh, I'll put a, a small caveat on the mild winter because we, we did have a pretty serious yes, uh, hard freeze for a yeah. couple of weeks as well. Uh, we had a bit of snow cover. Uh, so they probably had a, you know insulated properties for the uh, for the insects. What that's going to do to the overwintering insects, we're not really certain at this point. So we're we're doing a little bit of modeling uh, based on you know some of some of the long term trends that we've seen with uh, with uh, uh, reduced snowpack and and some of these real hard, uh, hard cold snaps. But animals that we're looking out for, of course, you know the the perennials, flea beetles and canola. You know we've got a couple of a uh, couple of uh, uh, Major species in uh, in Philotrita cruciferi and Philotrita striolata are the crucifer and striped flea beetles. Uh, later season, we're going to be keeping our eyes open for uh, for wheat midge. Uh, the the scouting that we did uh, 
this past year indicates that the population uh, is up a fair bit. Uh, we've seen reductions in other populations like cabbage seed pod weevil, pea leaf weevil, uh, and uh, and Bertha army worms. So we're we're, we're going to you know keep looking out for those uh, and uh, always monitoring for for animals like uh, for di like diamondback moth uh, and mm -hmm. for cutworms as well. So we don't specifically monitor for cutworms, but we're always keeping our eyes open for those ones. So. Absolutely. Um, actually, uh, producer Jay, if you've got it handy, I, I'm glad you mentioned the wheat midge. And between the two of you, actually, there's a few things that we definitely need to cover tonight, which is, of course, variety or hybrid selection as that relates to to insects for sure. Um, and then scouting and, and what you're, you know, anticipating potentially. But Jay, the wheat midge map, uh, if you can pull it up I, I found this sort of interesting uh, for sure that definitely there's some hot spots, but I also wanted to mention that apparently um, wheat midge don't cross into the Manitoba border. So everyone in Manitoba is safe. <laughs> that line there just cuts it right off. Um, there you go. So, so definitely, so catch us up though. Those to me look like rather large hot spots compared to what maybe we typically see with wheat midge. Uh, yeah, it's uh, they they are pretty extensive, and uh, they're they're much larger than we saw last year. There was some some cause for concern last year with the uh, with uh, uh, the density and the distribution, but it's even bigger this year. Uh, so yeah, growers uh, if they haven't made their 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 uh, seed purchase decisions, might you know if they're in those areas, might want to consider a uh, a varietal blend with uh, with the SM1 gene. Um, uh, if not, they're gonna they're gonna be out on Canada Day, uh, you know. Uh, uh, on their on their knees in the crops, looking for uh, uh, fragile little orange adults uh, flying around, um, and there has been a bit of news on chemical control for these animals, of course. So, uh, chlorpyrifos is on its way out, which is about the most efficacious product that we have for it. Uh, dimethoate is also efficacious for it, and happily we still have that one. Um, so, PMRA has issued a, a decision regarding chlorpyrifos, so that's uh, the active that you'd see in uh, products like Lorspan. Um, so they, they will no longer support the registration of that. So, uh, uh, one year to, uh, uh, to continue manufacture for that one, uh, one year of sales and then one year of continued use. So it's not completely off the table, but, uh, uh growers should be, should be aware that their, uh, their potential options for chemical control of this animal might be reduced. Okay. So this brings up a couple things. Uh, one, obviously if you're in any of those areas, um, Definitely, if you don't already have your wheat seed purchased, um, this might be a shift you might want to make potentially to those varietal blends that we do have. But it also sort of ties into, and Jay, if you can cue it up, I think we're going to start actually with clip two, which is Tracy's interview with Bern Tobin about corn rootworm, because this brings up a really key point about hybrid and variety selection um, and single gene traits and stack traits. So, so uh, Jay, maybe let's go to that clip now, and then we can talk about that because uh, Tracy's got a lot to cover here that ties in well with this. Now we've used, you know, primarily four BT proteins um, to successfully control this this pest. Um, yeah. uh, what's happening here? Why are they breaking down? Yes. Yeah, so when we first had these uh, cry proteins registered, there was one, uh, cry 3BB1. So most of the hybrids out there were single traits. Then these other additional cries, which you said four of them, um, were um, introduced into the marketplace. Then they started combining them within hybrids to what we call now pyramid hybrids, meaning that they, it contains two cry proteins that target the same pest, in this case, rootworm. However, those three of the four are very closely related. So once the rootworm has been exposed and able to tolerate one, it can tolerate at least three of them, the others, even though they weren't ever introduced to them. So even if you switch to a different pyramid hybrid that has a different combo of those three or four cry proteins, um, they're likely to able, to able to tolerate one or maybe both mm. in that hybrid. So... What does this do to that? You know, the traditional thought we have of multiple modes of action, stacking those high those those proteins together. What does that do to that as a management strategy? It's gone, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so even if you haven't had the cases this year, it's coming because 
as soon as we've seen that that tolerance start to happen, if repeated use of those cries continue, they can develop resistance in two or three years. And now, especially if there's still maybe one of those cry proteins out of the four that's still working, that means that that hybrid is a single trait mm. hybrid now. It's not a pyramid. And so these rootworm can develop resistance more quickly because they've only got to um, overcome one more mode of action. Yeah, so the, cl the clock is ticking on that as well, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. So, so let's that's talk where we've got to change the strategy up. Yeah, so let's, ta let's talk about strategy. You know, um, if, if those BTs are, are compromised, are we back to rotation again? Yes, that is the number one. It's always been the best option to manage rootworm, period, out of anything else. And this is the most important thing to do in the next two years to really knock back this rootworm population so there's fewer resistant individuals out there to continue this going forward. So we've got to do our best in um, rotating. Corn, corn rootworm needs corn. The larva cannot survive without corn roots being placed into the field that they're, the eggs were placed the previous year. So if we don't put corn in it, they die. And so you can imagine if, if across the landscape, and especially in these high risk areas, if a, a majority of them switch out of corn for a couple of years, we will see serious demolishing of these populations and really help us reset and start more sustainable practices in the future to, to manage rootworm. Now, some of the solutions you're talking about as well is getting creative. You talk about land swapping, different farmers yes. land swapping. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so there are that already does happen. Um, a lot of times livestock producers just don't have enough acreage to um, produce the, the amount of feed that they need. So they go and borrow or um, and plant into one of their neighbor's fields. Now, that will only work if they're actually utilizing a field that's in a three-year crop rotation so that, and it hasn't been in corn the previous year, so that that way they can put it into what I'd say is a virgin field that won't have rootworm, and then they won't even have to rely on a BT rootworm hybrid to be planted in that field to get their corn crop. So that's an option. And, and there are other feed sources that we can or alternative feed crops that they could uh, move to in the next two years. We're not saying that they just have to source their feed elsewhere. Um, there are cereal crops that can um, give a similar energy uh, source to the, the feed. Uh, it just requires them to be able to plant and harvest cereals. So I don't know about you, but I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> or not really, but this is, so Tracy, though, this is, this is a big deal. Um, so it is. yeah, bring me through sort of maybe the timeline here of when this was first noticed potentially of the resistance potentially breaking down um, and, and where we're at now. So we would have isolated fields, um, just random over the last five, six years or so. But in the last two, we realized there's clusters of um, repeated and, and obvious pyramid hybrid fields and different hybrid combos too, that tells us, yeah, we have now a problem. And so now we're looking at being very similar to what the US was dealing with back in 2013, just at the cusp when they realized they are approaching widespread uh, resistance to all of the cries and are now relying on a number of different strategies that are also not always working well. So I, I am concerned and I, I, I don't mean to fear monger, but I, I do feel that, you know, the, we have two or three years to try and clean up this issue before we're dealing with it always and back on the treadmill of needing to use soil and applied insecticides instead. Um, just to grow a, a corn crop and get enough feed. Because again, the one just one example of this past year, second year silage corn, the producer for the first time having rootworm issues, lost more than 50% of his yield. So we can't have a lot of, of silage and, and high moisture corn go that way, <laughs> or they won't mm -hmm. have anything to feed their livestock. So yeah, I'm a bit concerned. Yeah. Now you did mention, of course, this is a pest that does need those corn roots to to be there when it when it hatches um, or emerges. So, is a one year break enough? Is it is it at a minimum no corn on corn, or would two years be better? What would be ideal? 
preferably given the landscape and the abundance of adults that we've seen in the last few years, I would prefer to um, because isolated fields, when, when the neighbors don't rotate, <laughs> one or two fields that do aren't going to cut it. So we really do need to see uh, effort uh, taken to try and get at least two years in at least the problem areas where they they know they either they know their neighbors have had issues or they suspect they've seen a lot of adult activity that's making them question the effectiveness of their hybrids. Yeah, I think those are the areas that we need to focus and, and do a good job at rotating because that's as, as simple as it can get before it gets really sticky, icky, right? Mm -hmm. with, with all the different management tools you're gonna have to throw at them. So, and that is one of the things, of course, that we'll be bringing up many times through this this program is, you know, all the different tools that we have. But as you mentioned in that clip, rotation has always been sort of the first one, right? Yeah. Um, and when we shorten those rotations or or eliminate them entirely, we can end up with issues, something like this. So, um, yeah. uh, John has a question here on this topic. Can corn rootworm larva or otherwise and other detrimental pests hitchhike on planters? or field equipment from field to field, similar to the way zebra mussels infest the Great Lakes? It's a great question. So um, yes, um, potentially eggs could in the terms of rootworm, um, if you're picking up soil. If soil's getting carried, then uh, rootworm eggs could be carried too. By the time larva is hatched, you're in a full um, corn field, you know, uh, five foot corn, I, I doubt, you're going to be moving in soil. Now, another pest that can easily get carried uh, that we're worried about is alfalfa snout beetle in eastern Ontario. And that too hitchhikes on soil, um, on any equipment, um, and even the adults. The adults can't fly, so they walk or hitchhike. Um, and I think some of the first initial infestations of that pest came from construction sites and, and um, what was brought in, gravel that was brought into subdiv subdivisions that brought the pest there too suburbia um just kidding sort of and um, we are going to talk about the alfalfa snout beetle because it has a great name um but it also is showing up in my area so we will talk about that later um but james why don't you go back just quickly for anyone watching who doesn't know what a varietal blend is uh can you explain what that is and how that works because that is single gene resistance as tracy talked about you know even when we do stack that's not a, a guarantee so what's a varietal blend how does it work a uh, varietal blend is going to be a mix of 90% of plants that are expressing the trait for resistance. That is the SM1 gene uh, and 10%. And, uh, so it's, it's resistance in a bag. Uh, the 10% is required so, the, so that you get expression of, of the wild type or that is the susceptible in, uh, in the wheat midge. Uh, as long as you get that expression of the susceptible, it, it delays. Uh, overcoming that uh, that motor resistance, uh, it doesn't put it off forever. But we we've been growing these for for several years now, and to date, no expression of resistance uh, on a field level. Uh, so you know, uh, knock on wood, we we hope to maintain that. Okay, um, and now just to be specific, that is for for wheat midge, of course. But the concept of refuge in a bag, those sorts of things. I mean that. We do see that uh, in corn and some some other types as well. Uh, but just thought I'd, I'd tap on that just in case. Uh, so one of the other things, of of course, that we do talk about are beneficial insects. And so um, I want to go now. This this clip is a little bit longer, but we're going to start talking about wireworm. Um, and so this clip is with uh, John Gavlowski, the uh, entomologist out of Manitoba, who, if anyone has any questions about wheat midge in Manitoba, that's who you would call. Um, so I know in the comments there's some discussion there, and I know that that map does end at the Manitoba border. So yes, it is an issue in Manitoba. Please talk to John Kowalski. Um, and so we're going to go now. It's Kara Oosterhouse and John Kowalski talking wireworms. They they do mention, talk about beneficials, and then we'll, we'll come back and discuss this and that topic when we uh, come back on this clip. Okay, so wireworms are the larval stage of a beetle called the click beetle. And they differ from a lot of our beetle larvae in a few ways. Um, one is they have these multi-year life cycles where they're in the larval stage for a few years. Now, there's different species of wireworms across the prairies. The one that's most common here in Manitoba, uh, it has two or three years as a larva in the soil before it becomes an adult click beetle. 
some other species, um, the uh, prairie green wireworm, which is probably a bit more dominant further west, they will have four or five year life cycle. So you've got these larvae in the soil for prolonged periods of time. Um, wireworm larvae, they're beetle larvae, they never come above the soil surface. So their feeding is strictly below ground, which means they're not damaging your leaves and things. They're focusing on your roots and your seeds, but it also means it's tough to get at them with an insecticide. You cannot use a foliar insecticide and get control of the wireworm larvae that are in your field. Uh, the only thing you can do insecticide wise would be to have a seed treatment containing an insecticide on your seed. Okay, and what sort of uh, economic thresholds are around for wireworms? Unfortunately, we really don't have uh, researched economic thresholds. Uh, if people want to try to assess levels and um, make a decision for themselves, you can put what we call bait balls into the field. You can soak some corn or wheat or oatmeal, uh, make a bit of a ball out of it, and bury it into the soil. Use a flag or something to mark the area. Let it sit for a week or so and dig things up. If you're finding any more than one or two per bait ball, uh, you probably do have a, a population that could be damaging to your crop. If you're uh, having trouble finding them doing that, the decent chance you, you don't have a problem. However, that being said, um, bait balls can really vary in how effective they're going to be. The uh, wireworms are using carbon dioxide to find food, basically. So uh, your, your seeds, the roots, they give off carbon dioxide. And those carbon dioxide trails are what the wireworms follow to get to the plants. So if you've put a bait ball in a field that has a lot of green vegetation in it as a competing CO2 source, uh, that will affect how successful the bait balls are going to be. Okay, so what are some techniques that producers can actually use besides um, bait balls and insecticide? Can you spray for wireworms? You cannot do a foliar spray for wireworms. There's nothing registered. It would be, uh, I'll say useless, really. Uh, you, you won't get the insecticide down to where the wireworms are, no matter what you put on. So there aren't foliar sprays currently available. It's just insecticides, uh, seed treatments, rather, for insecticides. Now, Aside from the seed treatments, um, anything you can do to get quick germination and early growth, pretty much the same story we have for flea beetles, anything that gives you quick early growth will really help. So seeding into warm ground is good. Um, seeding at an appropriate depth, not too deep, might be helpful. Uh, packing the soil a bit might be helpful. So any anything to get that quick early growth will help you get through the more vulnerable period for wireworms. Um, where we often run into problems if people are seeding into cooler soil and the seed sits there a long time or that early growth is taking a long time, that can uh, increase your risk of the wireworms doing economic damage. So what sort of yield impacts do wireworms actually provide? Or not, so it's not provide, quite as, but... <laughs> yeah, what can they do? Uh, good question. Uh, they're, they're certainly not as devastating as some insects like um, flea beetles and cutworms. They tend to be patchy, so we're usually not looking at situations where you've lost 50% or 80% of your crop. It's usually going to be 5%, 10%, but even that can be quite significant at times, and it, it can even get worse than that. It's, it's often very patchy with wireworms, um, and again, not quite as extensive as, say, cutworms can be or flea beetle damage. So what does damage actually look like when producers are out and about and they're looking for wireworm damage? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Wireworm damage can be very deceiving, and it can get blamed as a lot of different things. Um, what you will notice is um, plants just don't seem to be coming up well in an area. Uh, you might see that some plants have emerged, and those early leaves look a little bit shredded that should tip you off that there's something happening, something's feeding on that plant. Now, the tricky part is with wireworms, you're not going to see the insect. All you're going to see is what looks like poor germination, 
or you may see some shredded leaves in addition. Dig around those damaged plants in those damaged areas. If you have a patch that just looks like things just didn't germinate for whatever reason, dig around, see if wireworms are potentially the cause. Now, there can be many reasons why things don't germinate well, so you need to sort that out. But do some digging, and especially, again, if you do see that the leaves, if they come up looking a little bit shredded, sometimes what happens is, although they feed totally underground, when those uh, newest leaves are coming out from the seed, uh, they're fed on underground, and when they do emerge, again, they're uh, a bit shredded in appearance. And are there any beneficial insects that actually uh, attack the wireworms? There are beneficial insects that eat them. One that we uh, know about that we've actually seen a fair amount of in the last couple of years, they're called thrivid larvae or stiletto fly larvae. Same bug. Thrivid, thrivid is the scientific name. Stiletto fly is the common name for the fly. Now, they're about the same size as a wire might maybe even a little bit bigger. So they're fairly big fly larvae, very narrow, almost transparent, uh, no legs. When you disturb them or poke at them, they go snaky. They wiggle around rapidly and go snaky when you disturb them. So behaviorally, they're quite different than a wire worm, and they're a lot paler. They're very, very white, almost translucent, whereas a wire worm is more of a yellow to orangey color. So if you see something wire worm like that just goes snaky when you poke at it, those are thrivids. They're good. They're eating your wire worms. And there's other things too in the soil. Uh, there's some ground beetles that actually uh, will burrow into the soil and look for insects to feed on, so they may be helping out as well. So I, I'm going to say right off the hop, Ray, I know the way we cropped that video, you couldn't see John's shirt, and it is a great shirt. So I highly recommend everyone go check out that school video and go check out a shirt because it's pretty great. Okay, so now we covered a lot of ground there, obviously wire room in general, but of course the importance of beneficials. So so uh, James, I want to start with you. Um, when we're talking in Saskatchewan, we're talking on the prairies, how prevalent is the idea of scouting not just for pests and for damage, but keeping in mind, let's say either through, you know, sweeps or, or digging or whatever, what else you're seeing, those beneficials, what else you're seeing besides the pest? How prevalent is that? I, I, I don't know if I'm if I'm getting the question. So you're you're wondering about the full gamut of insects that we collect as part of our service? Well, or? Okay, well, or how how prevalent is it that farmers are aware of you know counting those beneficials or paying attention to the beneficial insects that are there when they're also scouting for pests? Oh yeah, well, yeah, I, I take your point. So uh, what, one of the things that we're we're trying to promote is a program called Field Heroes. Uh, and that is to uh, to uh, promote the, the importance of, of beneficial insects, and and some some literature has been been produced uh, uh, for for different crop groups. So that's for pulses, cereals, oil, oil seeds, etc. Uh, and so looking for the major groups of, of beneficial insects for some of the major pests that you might see in those fields. So uh, it's uh, part of the, uh, the the program is called check your, uh, check your net. So it uh, it gives you uh, a broad over overview of some of the important natural enemies you might see for for important pests in important crops in the yes. important province of Saskatchewan. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the British Field Heroes covers a couple borders, but you know, uh, yeah, um, course, it, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's good information regardless of where you are. Um, now, Tracy, this is one of those things that certainly comes up uh, in scouting soybeans for sure, um, oh, in, in soybean aphid scouting, and in fact, it's even incorporated into the scouting app. So how does that work in, in Ontario? Yeah, so actually soybean aphids was one of the first that finally showed growers how effective natural enemies could be. And I would say the West took that same concept of a dynamic action threshold and use it on um, cereal aphids. So same kind of a scenario where not only do you scout for the number of aphids on a plant, but also you take a general sense of what the natural enemies are doing in terms of population. Based on that, we already know how many, let's say lady bird beetles or um, any any of the other natural enemies, how many aphids they can feed per day, and we know how temperature can affect them. So we our soybean um, aphid app, which is um, um, available for free, uh, soy, soybean or soy aphid app, um, or, or soybean, or no, it's aphid advisor, there we go, there <laughs> aphid we advisor go. app. And <laughs> there's too many apps now. Um, yeah. Then it can look at your forecast, 
calculate how many aphids that natural enemy population is going to have or take down and determine if you need to spray or you can wait uh, or let them be and allow them to, to manage them for you. So I, I would love to see more of that kind of research on all of our different key um, field crop pests because uh, I think it's got a lot of utility and it really does help reduce the number of sprays uh, that we would put on the crop. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, quickly, do you want to, now might be a good time because we're talking about soybeans, of course, um, but also spider mites. Tracy, you do have a project yeah. that you're working on. We want to make sure that we get this out there um, for anyone who's who's watching now or watching out the recording. Um, spider mites in Ontario, what is this project about? Yes. So um, we're starting to see applications of dimethoate on spider mites on soybeans and dry beans not be effective. And of course, sometimes that can be due to application error or just the timings off. There's so many eggs still in the on the plants and the products don't work on the eggs. But unfortunately, based on some of the preliminary work done from samples taken last year, we think we're starting to see dimethoate resistance which dimethoate is the only active we have available um, for on either soybeans or bean crop for spider mites. So with Egg Canada and Western uh, University um, from funding with GFO, uh, we are um, going to take and sample more sites. So any, any growers who's starting to see um, soybean or, uh, Population, population spider mites and soybeans or dry beans, um, we can go out and collect. And um, we're also trying to develop a detection tool that within field or at least rapid um, testing right at the lab to tell you if you've got resistance. Um, and also for them to test different products um, that we hope there is something successful that could get registered. Okay, so keep that in mind, everybody, as you're uh, out and about uh, this summer, as you're scouting. Um, okay, James, I want to go to you because, of course, we can't talk Western Canada without talking about canola, which means we also can't talk about insects in Western Canada without talking about flea beetles. So um, what what do we have for scouting, or do we just assume they're everywhere? Be ready. Yeah, it's... Uh... You know, application of seed treatments for the flea beetles is based on the assumption that they're everywhere. Uh, that this this isn't this isn't the case uh, in most cases. I mean, the the, the population the populations can be sporadic. They can be you know heavy locally and and absent in a, in a nearby region. So I mean, the, they they do aggregate um, uh, uh, you know, with with members of their own species and uh, and. Uh, uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of flea beetle damage, this, but it, it, because it is a perennial pest, um, and uh, the odds are pretty high that you're going to see some damage. Uh, then typically, a seed dressing is going to go down on, on nearly 100% of the, of the canola that goes down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now one of the things, of course, in this, as we said, we're going to talk about all the different tools. And of course, uh, seed treatments are one of them. But scouting is also incredibly important. So Jay, if you could queue up, right. uh, we did, we did, of course, um, thank you, James, for setting this along. Because one of the things and we talked about it last week, uh, we talked about what does 25% damage feeding damage look like on cotyledons because this is of course sort of that's that trigger um but it can be hard to judge 25 or 30 or, or 15 to 25 so uh jay if you can bring up that schematic we'll we'll take a look at that and james if you can if you can maybe talk us through um sort of some of these recommendations here of what we're looking at you bet. Yeah. So th this is a, this is a figure that was produced by the Canola Council of Canada, uh, and damage is uh, is indistinguishable between the two flea beetle uh, flea beetle species. So that is Cruciper and striped flea beetles. Uh, you can see here. I mean, the difference between twenty five percent and thirty five percent, and of course this is this is stylized. Uh, there is a photo at the bottom there, so you can have a look at what twenty five percent actually looks like, and it it can be uh, difficult to distinguish. I mean, there, there, there's a bit of an art to it and no two people do it exactly the same way. But uh, it, that said, 25% uh, of course is your action threshold. So, so that's, uh, if you're starting to see that, you want to consider control because the damage can accumulate very quickly, uh, particularly if numbers are high. So if you've got 25% and you've got a lot of flea beetle activity in the field, then you may want to consider overspraying. Uh, once you get to 50 percent you're you're likely looking at an economic hit and and after that it's just you weep and then you reseed um and yeah yeah it's, usually uh, in that order maybe maybe the other way yeah 
uh, yeah, re re reseeding does happen, of course, and uh, as, as does overspray. Um, one, of, one of the things that came up in this past season is we had a lot of sandblasting with a really windy spring. Uh, so there will be environmental factors that will get dovetailed along with flea beetle damage. Previous years, we, we saw frost damage coupled with flea beetle damage. And so that needs to be taken into account. And of course, if you get great big bear patches, that's going to have an influence as well. Uh, you know, as far as reseeding goes. Uh, but yeah, the environmental uh, issues like the sandblasting and like the uh, like the frost damage coupled with flea beetle damage need to be taken into account on a field by field basis. Um, so you had a previous question about surveying for them. We don't actually conduct a survey for flea beetle populations uh, in in, uh, in Western Canada. There is some work that's uh, that's been proposed to look at, at uh, surveying for flea beetle populations. Uh, but it hasn't been initiated. There was some work done by Julie Soroka at Ag Canada uh, to determine uh, the extent of a potential species composition sh uh, shift in in, uh, in these animals. So that is shifting from what were areas that were traditionally cruised for flea beetle becoming striped flea beetle. Uh, striped flea beetle, as, as many may, may or may not know, is, is less sensitive to a lot of the commercial insecticides that are available. And so this will influence management decisions as well. Uh, but it does seem that that this shift is ongoing. So uh, the the straight flea beetle, which was typically restricted to northern regions, is moving south. Uh, it seems the movement has slowed slightly recently, uh, but but it, it it is still continuing. They're just gathering strength before they really, you know drive yeah, on yeah. I, yeah. Um, yeah so yeah jason jason has a question here are there any beneficials that would work on flea beetles so do, do they have natural there, partners they do you know the, the uh, there's lots of things that will eat flea beetles the, the big trick of flea beetles is uh, of course the name flea beetle is because they have those those great big muscular hind femurs and they can uh, they can leap away at, uh, at a moment's notice and they're pretty good flyers excellent jumpers uh so they're they're tough to catch uh but i've seen uh, all sorts of generalist predators with flea beetles in their mouths, including ladybugs, which which actually really so it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen occasionally. Occasionally, uh, there there is a specialist uh, parasitoid uh, that attacks the adults. Unfortunately, it doesn't inflict that much damage on these on the populations of these animals. Uh, so, okay. as far as natural enemies, it really is a numbers game. There's just so many flea beetles that it's really difficult for natural enemies to have a have, have a serious impact on them. I feel like ladybugs deserve an award. They seem to just be <laughs> so really, they just, they eat everything and they're just, you know, anyway, or they're larvae at least. Anyway, they really do. So, um, I mean, other ladybugs, so. Yeah. <laughs> Although, okay, I have two entomologists on here. My house is infested with harlequin. I'm pretty sure they're harlequin beetles, aren't they? Is that what they harlequin. are, Tracy? Or the, like they, they're um, like, they, they look like ladybugs, but they're not because ladybugs are under the leaf litter right now. Is that so, yeah? I don't ladybugs know. can overwinter in a home too. I, I oh. have some that pop once in a while too. Yeah. So it might just they, be a different species of lady beetles. They're yeah. jerks. And so, because yeah, they're in my house. The and they, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, James. Oh, no, sorry. Typically in the West, we would see box elder bugs. So, yes. You know, okay. I have some of those too. Yep. Yeah. I have some. Yeah. So, another one of the things that this, of course, brings up is that I have noticed because I do. I, I do respect what insects do and I respect the job that they do. So I am, I do like to identify them and whatever, but I would prefer they were not in my home. Um, but I do notice they seem to go in like waves. So we have like a bad year, a not so bad year. But it, like, so just like, you know, with many of these insects, understanding that life cycle really does, can make a huge difference in how long you rotate away from a crop or when you scout for the, you know, adults, or is it the larva you're after or whatever the case may be. I mean, this is, these are important things to understand, right? On, and so that whole know thy enemy kind of thing. Um, and I did want to mention uh, one of the points that John made that I think is really important. And James, you hit on it as well, is if you've got bare patches in a field or if you've got, you know, poor germination and like figure out what happened. Right, in that it could it could be disease, but what if it's an insect? Right, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, okay. I want to move to because we're. I told you it goes fast. Um, okay. Jason says that ladybugs are overrated. I think Jason needs to be told because well, they are. I don't like the multicolored Asian, but yeah, the other is yeah. the natives. They're pretty cool. They yeah, they're okay. Some... See, there you go. They deserve some respect. 
Jason. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, I, I do want to go. I want to go to our next clip. And uh, Tracy, you're you're in all of these ones, just about. Anyway, we did have one other one, but I'm going to skip over that one uh, because Kara, Kara, it was one of the her first season with Real Agriculture, and she's about twelve and a half. And she asked me not to uh, not to run it because she's so young. Yet. <laughs> anyway, that's partially true. Um, mostly well. false. Okay, so the, so for this clip though, this is uh, Tracy again. You and and Burn. Um, I'm a little jealous. It was out in the field back when we used to get to do those things standing side by side. Um, we are going to talk in this clip, we're going to talk Western bean cutworm. Um, but also this will move us into sort of our discussion that builds on this one about, you know, th that threshold of, of spring. So uh, Jay, if we can go to clip four, this is uh, Tracy and Byrne talking Western bean cutworm and more. <laughs> Now, the big conversation here today um, yes. is about Western bean cutworm. Yes. Um, you know, I think uh, we're going to have some challenges here with this this year, and yes. especially that, that flight, that moth flight, and that timing, as you uh, suggested earlier. Yes. So uh, we're lining up because the corn was delayed in planting for most of the crop to be at the ideal crop stage for the moths to want to lay their eggs. So peak flight usually happens the last few weeks of July, first week of August, and that's when they're going to be ideal in the corn, uh, finding that pre-tassel, tassel stage to lay the eggs. So we think, you know, growers really need to get out and monitor, scout for eggs, and determine if they've reached threshold and time it properly. Last year caught everyone off guard because it wasn't just the hot spot regions. And that's, that's our message here. Don't assume because you're outside of the hot spots of Boston well in Tilsenburg, you're not at risk. Everyone's at risk. Use traps to determine if they're present in your area and then scout and spray if need be. Mm. Talk a little bit before we wrap it up uh, on yes. fungicide, fungicide timing here. Yes. So important to coat those silks. Yes. So issue last year, um, western bean really doesn't cause as much yield impact as they do allow for the introduction of, of ear molds and um, mycotoxins. So you really want to not only spray with an insecticide to control the insect, but also protect the crop with the fungicide. And so the timing is a little off if you try to um, manage both. But what we're trying to recommend is that you kind of move their timings into the middle where you're going with a tank mix just when those silks are coming out. So you're targeting both insecticide as well as fungicide and protecting the ear from both the insect and the fungicide, fun right. fungus too. Yeah, final question for you. And you know, as an entomologist, how would you like to see the rest of this year go? Uh, <laughs> to sort of to minimize it impact. It would be awesome if yeah, the bugs would just go away, but they're not. Mm. Um, I think not to panic though. Mm. Everyone's panicking. All of a sudden when they see a soybean aphid on a soybean plant, they're like, oh, we got to spray. Or if I'm finding moths in a, a bucket trap, they've got to spray. That's not the case. We've, we've got scouting recommendations there for the purpose of actually going in, following IPM and managing the pest if it needs to. So, mm. so you're going to be doing a lot more field walks, but yeah. uh, I don't necessarily think every single field is going to have to be sprayed and, and be an issue. So it's just keeping your head cool and and looking for the pest and following thresholds now i'm trying to remember what year that was tracy do you remember did it turn out 2017 terrible? yeah is that what <laughs> no, okay that was, was 2017 four years ago i missed yeah, being outside okay. like that <laughs> I know. I also, I will say, I just, I love seeing the green and, oh, I'm, I'm quite excited. So, so um, now this does of course bring up, um, maybe let's just quickly talk about Western bean cutworm. So this is one of those ones that we do put the traps, traps out for. Yeah. We do scout for the egg. So, so walk us through what, are, where are we at with Western bean cutworm as far as some increasing issues there? Yeah, so um, first I've got to give credit for the Great Lakes and uh, Maritime Pest Monitoring Network because we had 1,600 traps out last year, 1,000 of them being Western Bean from anywhere from Michigan to Nova Scotia. Um, what we're finding though is that at least in Ontario, it's becoming more endemic even in Eastern and Central Ontario. So your area um, where it used to just be just slowly sporadic. Now it's likely overwintering there and in Quebec. So it's now no longer just an issue for down in Southwestern Ontario. It's um, much more sp widespread. That said, it's still not coming at levels like we saw five years ago, um, which is good. Um, and we're seeing natural enemies come into um, the fields more. So our next, my next big 
wish list is for us to really figure out that the impact of those natural enemies so that when we're scouting and trying to diligently look for the eggs and I realize that in itself is a problem, um, we can also take them into consideration. Now on dry beans, that's different game. Um, we are going to have to change the, the strategies there. Maybe try and see drones, something can detect their presence just from the impact on the feeding on the plants because humans just, it's almost in dry beans. So I recognize there's some issues there, but um, really, you know, again, this is a pest when it comes to corn. If we could forecast dawn and mycotoxin development, that's really what would tell us if we needed to spray or not, um, because it isn't a yield issue. It's, it's, you know, you're managing the pest, hoping that the environment won't make mycotoxins really bad. And that's the best we can do. But I, you know, I am concerned. We're now relying fully on VIP corn um, for BT strategy and then these insecticides. And um, this pest has already overcome one tool. Uh, we really do have to rotate these tools for Western bean. And especially I, I can see corn rootworm kind of changing some of those strategies too on us and, and it may influence our um, resistance development on, on VIP too with Western bean. So um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting few years. Well, and uh, hey, it's you're always going to have a job because <laughs> everything keeps changing. <laughs> Um, and we have to figure it out, right? So there we go. And that's why we that's why we need but also, entomologists. Don't feel like yeah. we can find the answer. <laughs> so, well, yeah. but we have to keep trying, right? Um, yeah. James, I've got a question for you here because uh, you did bring up specifically on flea beetles. We did talk about, of course, uh, so sand, or wind blast or or you know if we've got frost damage. And so Jason is asking, should thresholds change when there are compounding influences like frost? Yeah, and, and I think uh, it, in short, yes, and uh, and it should be a case by case. I think I think you need to look at the environmental issues that that are at play, uh, and and factor these in. And uh, I, I think expert agronomists can, can provide some insight on that, uh, as can you know regional specialists and and provincial specialists or or Ag Canada folk, uh, if uh, if people are feeling stuck. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, environmental damage should be factored in with uh, with uh, with the thresholds. Uh, one thing that one thing that uh, does come up as well is is with uh, relatively cool wet conditions, uh, the striped flea beetle in particular can actually hunker down a little bit and, and engage in what's what's called stem feeding, uh, which is uh, a lot of discussion going on right now as to what does that mean for threshold because with very little damage you end up with complete loss of a of a seed length. Uh, so I don't have a hard answer for that right now, but it is it is the source of rich discussion. We'll say, uh, hopefully, have an answer for it in, in the near future. Uh, interesting. And what a jerk. Um, because of course this is where, this is why we hate something, right? Like why we, why we hate cutworm is because it just, and it's gone and then you're done. There's no recovering from that. Right. Um, which is one of those issues. So, um, I want now, we don't have a lot of time left, so, uh, we're going to spend a bit of time. There's a few interesting, um, insects I, I do want to talk about. Uh, James, I do want to talk a bit about sweet midge slash mystery midge. Are we going with that it is a sweet midge in Saskatchewan no. that that was found. No, it's a different midge plus sweet midge. midge. How many how many no. midges are there? Too many. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's uh, yeah, it's 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 the cessids are uh, it's a big family. It's a very diverse family. Uh, so no, this uh, uh, to date sweet midge has not been detected in Saskatchewan. Uh, we still monitor for it with uh, with uh, pheromone traps uh, throughout the province and throughout Western Canada, but to date not detected. Uh, what was detected was uh, uh, what's uh, uh, now being called canola flower midge, and uh, the symptoms are different. Um, so it results in uh, what look like bottled flowers. Uh, so the the damage is relatively conspicuous, and, and almost think about little coke bottles hanging off of uh, off of where a, a normal a, a normal flower might be. Uh, so that that flower is done. Um, it seems to be relatively widely distributed. Uh, prevalent more in the northeast of, uh, of, of Saskatchewan, so that is more northern growing areas. Uh, and uh, the economics of it are uncertain. We had one field in 2019 that looked like uh, it could be at economic levels, but overall populations have been low and typically concentrated on field edges, but not sweet midge, happily. 
Okay. So Tracy, of course, here in Ontario, sweet midge is a major pest of canola. Um, so we had a question last week on, you know, is canola, is spring canola anyway, sort of off the table for Ontario, but we know there are regional differences for sure up where I am. There are those that grow spring canola, but there's winter canola uh, closer your way. So is sweet midge still a, a major limiting factor? Yeah, absolutely. And flea beetle, yeah. <laughs> almost everything that they're dealing with. <laughs> All of them. Um, and yeah. cabbage seed pod weevil for the winter canola. So, yep, it's a crop that really does need to be monitored um, and, and paid attention to uh, in the season. But yes, Swede midge, you know, fluctuates year to year if it's a real issue, but um, still a problem pest that's not easy to manage. <laughs> Parasitoids, mm -hmm. that's our best route. There you go. Yeah, I was going to say this is, yeah. And of course, we do call, you know, canola the Cinderella crop, but I just think it's more princess <laughs> and high maintenance. But anyway, that's just me. It is beautiful. <laughs> I like the smell. People in Ontario think I'm weird because they think it smells like cabbage. Um, but that's okay. Now, um, so this one, this next one, Tracy, is kind of kind of neat. Not really because it is my area. But Jay, if you could pull up some of those slides on the alfalfa snout beetle. Tracy, tell me about this. And, and this is, of course, one yep. of those ones that you're also looking for some feedback this year. Um, yes, so, so, so what is this lovely looking critter? Yeah, they're pretty big um, weevils, like a beetle, but they have fused wings, so they walk. Um, the adults don't really have an um, impact on alfalfa, and, and they can feed on clover, but it's the larva. So the adults um, have, they'll be laying eggs, they'll be coming out right now in April, because they can't fly, they march to a nearby field if they don't like the one they're in. They're even you can find them crossing the roads in eastern Ontario. Um, but it's the larva that's the real problem. So those eggs will hatch, and from about June to November of that same year, those larvae girdle the tap root of the alfalfa. And I don't think enough people are paying attention um, to this because if they don't see the adults moving, they may attribute some of the feeding injury. Um, that the larvae are doing because above ground you see uh, the plants starting to die back or yellow like leafhopper burn um, or you won't, some don't even notice it till spring or after winter when there's a lot of winter kill and assume it's something else. So I, I really would like um, anywhere from Kingston uh, to Ottawa, we know there's sporadic um, fields, but uh, we really need to start honing in on where these fields are because there's potential. There's there's biocontrol nematodes, the same ones we're trying to get um, into the rootworm situation. It works on alfalfa snout beetle from Cornell University. And so if we can apply them on these problem fields, it actually suppresses them and reduces um, them moving around. But as I mentioned earlier, this is a pest that can get carried from equipment, leaving these infested fields and going to um, non-infested fields. So it's important to really start digging, plan to dig September, October timeframe with your shovel and um, look at those problem gaps in, in living just slightly off that edge of that gap. Um, any living plants that are still there and look for the larva. And then if you know that that's a field, uh, let us know because one, we'd like, uh, we do have some funding to apply biocontrol nematodes, um, but also just to know that that's an infested field so we can help you rotate uh, when needed to get out of that cycle of that pest because um, insecticides don't work on it. So it is something that's come from New York and the pictures there and right across the border, um, we have the problem here in Ontario. So uh, I really would like to encourage growers to look in their alfalfa fields, either this April for those adults moving around, um, but also in um, any time this summer when you start to see plants going, going off, um, start digging and plan to dig in September to see those larvae. Okay, and now this is this is one you did mention uh, again with with sort of that longer life cycle. So rotation can help here, but but that's part of the thing is that alfalfa is a perennial, so it is there for several years. So would you should let's say someone finds it, would that mean shortening your alfalfa rotation? Like like yes. That so out? the best okay. option is to shorten it. Um, to three years only, and really to time it so that you're off the cycle of the larva. So you're seeding when, because the larva stays um, hibernation for a full year after that first year, which is kind of weird, eh? Oh, wow. Doesn't do anything. Yeah. So if you can time it to seed your crop then and avoid adults laying eggs in it, 
um, then you can actually get away with two more years of that crop before you plow it down and put a non-host for a year. So it's very similar, it lines up like rootworm. Two or three years mm -hmm. of the host crop, but then rotate out to, to cut this back. Something but else. again, biocontrol nematodes have been proven to be really successful for this. So it's okay, another option. Okay, so that's, that's my next question. Are you saying like I could order nematodes? Yep, you can, but also give give us a call because um, Omafra yeah. has gotten some funds to do some okay. acres. We can't do everybody, but we can yeah. start um, helping to apply nematodes to to impact this pest. Okay, so now though you've blown my mind because how do you apply nematodes? <laughs> like, do you spray you them? You can all? by sprayer or by manure. Okay. In New York, they've done this <gasps> testing and they've done sprayer without the screens and the nozzle, but also yeah. um, they've found that they can apply it on manure, um, in manure on the ground, and they'll find their yeah. way into the soil. And it can be okay. done in the fall in alfalfa, which is nice because it's not like rush, yeah. rush, get it done this spring. So, yeah. yeah. As Kara says, Amazon Prime nematodes? Yes. <laughs> That's no, Cornell University. Okay, yeah, if Cornell. you Google okay. Alison Gios, yeah. he's got all that work done. Oh my gosh. Okay, so James, let us know if you would like some nematodes, and we'll see <laughs> if we can find one that works <laughs> for flea beetles, and then we'll have solved everyone's problems here. Um, absolutely. Yes, okay. That's actually yeah. an, an interesting an interesting thought. Is it yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And for, and for, a, for a number of other problems. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They're no, native. It's pretty They're fascinating. native to North America, so it's not right. Like okay, so in this is. Yes. And this is something that, of course, we've certainly seen out West with some of these parasitic wasps and those sorts of things is that we, we are learning very much about the fact that, you know, if we're not just who they are, but how they work and what they do. And, and you know, could we potentially be um, working at increasing their populations faster so that they can work for us, of course, tiny little soldiers in the field. Um, James, I wanted to, before we're running out of time here, but I did want to very quickly, because there has been um, so much talk about drought conditions and dry conditions in the West, to me, that um, that just means grasshoppers. Um, and I know Alberta had some pretty nasty grasshopper infestations last year. What does the map look like for grasshoppers for 2021? Should I be concerned? Uh, over Overall, though, overall less than the pre less than they were last year. Uh, are we oh. after month? Uh, yeah. So overall, we, we do have a bit. Of, we do have some warm spots. You can see by Lethbridge a relative hot spot. Uh, of course, we got. Uh, um, there are going to be about four or five uh, economically important species of grasshoppers across the prairies. Most of what we see is going to be two stripe, uh, but we've also had uh, uh, really dense localized populations of clear wing grasshopper as well. Uh, you can see that Manitoba, as well as has has experienced uh, um, um, a, a relative, uh, relatively decent numbers of grasshoppers as well. But they really like it dry. Uh, the wet conditions contribute to uh, primarily bacterial and fungal infections. Uh, and uh, one thing that we did see in Saskatchewan, in uh, in areas with outbreaks of clearing grasshopper, uh, was that numbers were getting uh, 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 greatly reduced by uh, by a fungus called Entomophthora. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it was as if an insecticide had been applied. It was just dead grasshoppers. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, many on the ground, many cling to the, cling, cling, clinging to plants, and uh, and uh, no uh, no insecticidal application on that site or sites. Hmm. Okay. Um, I do I do want to point out for anyone in the Lethbridge area, sorry. Um, because that that looks really bad, and they are super dry. It's where our head office is. It's where Sean Haney lives. They've had ridiculous winds all winter. There's topsoil blowing everywhere. Um, and look out for the grasshoppers. Sorry about your luck. Um, let's hope they get some moisture. I did learn though through through the field heroes and through the um, uh, pest and predators podcast. I had no idea that grasshopper eggs were food for so many other insects. That is like mm -hmm. that is a super cool mm -hmm. fact. I had no yeah, idea. Including, including crickets, oddly enough, yeah. Yeah. So, like, anyway, okay. Insects are cool, everybody. See, Jason, I told you. Anyway, <laughs> um, they really are. I just, I'm always fascinated by, and I know that there are, you know, bacteria and, and fungicide that can be beneficial and all those sorts of things too, uh, or fungus. But like, it it just amazes me how some insects are just so specialized to do such a fantastically neat thing um you know like lay their eggs a certain way or lay their eggs in their prey or whatever the case may be and they just they're fascinating it is so cool to me how these teeny little insects all 
get along and sometimes very much do not. Um, so thank you for all the work that you do in, in what I'm sure is sometimes a thankless job. Um, now, okay, so Tracy, of course, Tracy, you got your, your plugin. So we're, you're talking spider mites. Um, so that's a, an Ag Canada and Western University with some GFO funding. So of course, uh, that's one to watch the alfalfa snout beetle, of course. Uh, um, also, or sorry, weevil, also one to watch. Um, and James, Obviously, there's some pretty fantastic um, monitoring out in Saskatchewan as well. Is there anything that you would want either agronomists or farmers to know as far as participating in any of the surveys? Is there anybody you're looking for this year? Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. Is uh, uh, So we, we have some proposed changes to our Trespass Act, uh, which has meant that we've had to rely on a permission-based uh, survey program. So if, uh, if growers want to reach out to our Ag Knowledge Centre, we would, we would really appreciate it having them sign up for uh, for access to the lands for our, for our best surveys. Yes. Okay. And uh, and of course, everybody wear your biosecurity booties. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> They're very fashionable. They come in blue, clear, all sorts of other ones. Okay. Everybody gets them. Um, I think Ray is calling me creepy. So you know what? That's okay because insects are great. So there you go. All right. That thank you, James. Thank you, Tracy, so much for joining me tonight. This was uh, this went very quickly. Um, but I was writing down as we spoke, I was writing down all the different insects that we talked about and not including the beneficials. I think we got through almost like eight. So that's that's pretty good, I think, for an hour and covering West and yep. East. I think I think yep. we did well. Um okay, so, so not, not a problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's hope nothing <laughs> shows up this year that's way out of that. We didn't even talk about soybeans as nematode. We didn't talk anyway. Um, but we'll get there, right? Okay. Another another night. I'm sure we could do this many times over. Uh, anyway, so thank you, of course, uh, to to James and to Tracy for joining me tonight. Thank you, everybody who was here uh, in the comments and and following along. Uh, please check out realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow uh, to sign up for your continuing education credits. Um, and always, we are here Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern. Don't have a topic for next week. So if you've got an idea, just uh, send it to me. I'll, I'll see if I can pitch it and find some experts to weigh in. Uh, but we do have, of course, uh, the Real Ag Live goes tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern on our live feed as well. So check that out. I think we're, we're talking corn and soy tomorrow. Um, all right. That's our show. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for getting real Thanks. and getting connected. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.